So tell us when your family started coming. Did my family started coming at the beginning. So my great-great-grandfather was one of the original stockholders, so he brought his family. And do you know what year that was? 1881. 1881. Mm -hmm. And there were only three children at the time, but my great-grandmother was the third child, and she was almost two. And then she brought her family and so on and so on. So, Do you know why they chose to come here? It was a group of gentlemen from Chicago, from the First Congregational Church. And they were looking for a site in northern Michigan to start a for-profit resort. And so they went on a fishing trip. And they went to Mackinac and Petoskey and Shalvoy, visiting other resorts. And they just really loved Charlevoix with its obviously great fishing with the three lakes and uh, the clean air and those you know cool nights and so they spoke to Mr. Dixon you know John Dixon who had Terrace Farm and he owned most of the north side of Shalvoy. and uh, they purchased 30 acres and you know had it cleared and the next summer they opened in July of 1881 and there was a clubhouse, which had rooms for rent. And uh, if you were a stockholder, you could stay in the clubhouse, or you could rent a cottage, or even build a cottage on leased land. So then my family built a cottage in 1883 on, on Pine River, you know, overlooking the island. And um, as I said, we've been coming ever since. It's been a big part of you know, family life. Now, do people, are there people from all over the country that, that, come, that came or originally, or did, was it just Chicago area, or, you know, how did... As I said, it was, it was this group of Congregationalists, mm -hmm. and, um, and the name of the company was the Chicago Summer Resort Company, but it was always called the Chicago Club informally. Right. Um, but eventually, you know, it branched out, and there are families from New York and California, but mostly from the Midwest. And they would come by train later, so or by boat, right. you know. Did most people stay for the whole summer? Was that it? They did. It was, it's, you know, definitely a season, and you would come beginning of June, middle of June, and you would stay almost through Labor Day. And um, it's changed obviously since then because sure. people can't do that anymore. Right. No. But uh, and they ate all their meals at the clubhouse. And there are lots of activities that are quite athletic, I think. They, sailing was a big thing. And of course, golf and tennis. Did it start that way? Or? Well, actually, they had you know, services every morning, uh, led in the clubhouse until about 1890. And members used to row into town on Sundays to attend the congregational church services. And they were allowed to race on the way back. <laughs> but um, then, a few years after that, they started hymn sing on Sundays, and that's still a tradition. That's my favorite, and it's every Sunday night after Sunday buffet. Everyone goes into the the room next to the dining room, and members always used to accompany on the piano. It's all a cappella, you know. After that, people raise their hands and they're called on. So the same hymns are usually called every Sunday, and um, it's a marvelous tradition for all the generations. So then your parents started coming when they were young too, or? Mm hmm She came when she was one, and, and her mother, and so. <laughs> yeah. Now, and you started coming um, again when you were a young child? It's the summer I turned, you know, I was a baby, mm -hmm. turned one. Mm -hmm. What's your first memory? Oh, well, it's just your freedom that you have as a child. It's fantastic. You know, you just push open the door and, you know, your friends and your cousins, and everybody's out there and, um, and family and tradition. The same, it's the same every summer. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. I think once you start having your own children, you come back and you bring your children because you want to have them have, them have the same experiences. Um, the whistle going off at noon and at 9.30. And hearing the fairy yeah. horn go off, um, 
when the train used to go by, you know, the freight train, and having the trestle close, hopefully after you've tacked through the channel <laughs> for your sailing lesson. Um, and just the long nights. I mean, you know, it's, it's, they're crisp, they're beautiful, you also sleep so well, but also it stays light so late. So it's just fun, as I said, great freedom. So you learned to sail here and the tennis and the golf? Did you learn that too? Well, I didn't do the golf. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky. I was in a large group of children at the club, and there are so many of us that they started having counselors mm -hmm. who would teach tennis and swimming and sailing. Mm -hmm. And it was marvelous because, you know, being on the younger end of that, I didn't quite get to be the skipper. But crewing, and we had tournaments, and we had play against Belvedere and other associations. Um, and there's cycles in uh, different communities, so we're sort of on a smaller end right now. But uh, we still have organized activities for the children, and a couple days a week. So when you started coming, how many kids were there your age? I, mean. I think there might have been even 50 or 60. Oh. You know, within mm -hmm. you know ten years of each other, which was huge. Yeah. You know, because we're not that big compared to you know Belvedere. So how how big are is the Chicago? Um, there are about thirty cottages. Mm -hmm. So, and not everyone's here the entire season because you really right. can't do that anymore. Has it been about that size the whole time? Well, there are maybe about ten cottages by eighteen ninety. And then by the 50th anniversary, there are 29 or 30. And some, they come and go. Right. <laughs> you know, some, some are burned, some are torn down, you know, some are sold off, away. And, um, but now we're back up to 30 again, so. Now, do you think the traditions are the same as actually back to the early 1900s? Some of the things that they Well, have. they're no longer lights out at 10 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Um, but as I said, you know, it's about family and, and all the meals used to be at the clubhouse. You sat at your family tables and, and now they're just a couple a week. But as I said, that Sunday dinner is what I think a great part of bringing the community together. And then as I said, going over to him saying, and uh, it's very important. I think that's what sort of ties. Did you almost get more family here than the rest of the year? Because oh, you saw more of them, definitely, because yes. you had grandparents and cousins, and mm -hmm. um, and that was special too. So, mm -hmm. did you keep friends with the same group of people, you know, almost year round and throughout the years and things like that? Yes, and some, you know, sometimes you weren't in touch, you know, during the winter, but boy, you were glad to see them when you came back up, you know, that first day in the summer. So. Did they keep the church tradition and the, the congregations thing going, or? Um, well, I think that waned. You know, they had their, as I said, their morning services, right. and then they had uh, readings uh, where they would go to someone's farm and mm -hmm. have readings, and people would quote things or do writing. That was right. a wonderful tradition there for a while, and then it just sort of evolved into just the hymn saying. Which is marvelous. I mean, if you when you first memorize the first two mm -hmm. uh, verses of a hymn, it's just marvelous. And as I said, the same ones are usually called over and over again. You know, every Sunday, every summer. Now, is do you have kids here now that are? Oh, I don't, but I have yeah. nieces and uh -huh. my cousins' children. So it, so it is carrying on, right. which is which is lovely, which is so important, I think. Mm -hmm. And are they doing the same type of things now as they did when you were here? And I know it's not as sailing as much. Sailing okay. was very, very big in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And then it kind of segued into tennis. When I was growing up, tennis right. was the thing. You'd get up and put on your tennis clothes, and right. you'd be waiting at the top of the stairs for the grown-ups to finally finish so that you could you know, hit against the backboard or have a lesson. So, um, And now it's more water sports, you know, and golf, but once again, still tennis, but it just changes with each generation. Right, but they still have the family tradition. Oh, of course, yes. And they still have the program for the children. It's just much younger children and just in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Do they still do the Sunday buffet for everyone? Oh, yes. As I said, that's the key thing that I think is right. really brings everyone together and 
And That's my favorite tradition. Most people come to that and to the hymn sing too? Oh, yes. All ages. Mm -hmm. right. And that's the whole point. It is. That's everybody. Yeah, because that's yeah. community, that sense of community that's mm -hmm. so important. Has that helped you in your life? You know, having this little kind of stable little thing that's... Oh, consistency. I think it's really important and just having a, a core group of people that you're all, you're all family. You, know, you look out for each other and for each other's children and they said it's a great sense of community. Okay. You have some notes, so share with me what you have that you wanted to share. Well, did you you want to know more about the golf? Sure. Yeah. What that, about um, golf? In about 1896, there was Mr. Wilson and Mr. Waller, and they started the golf course, the golf club. And it was only nine nine holes, and Willie Watson, um, a Scotsman, he designed the course. And about four years later, they added 100 acres to it, incorporating Mr. Wilson's farm and some land from Mr. Waller, who had uh, the bungalow property um, over on Lake Michigan. And so it was an 18-hole course, and it was wonderful. And uh, Willie Watson then later in 1925 designed Belvedere's course. But in the height of the Depression, um, the club gave the course to Charlevoix for one dollar and hoping it would be kept intact. But uh, a, few years, a few years later they had to, they sold off property for residential and commercial. But then it became the first public course in Michigan and one of the first ones in the uh, United States, which is fantastic. Yeah. And so I think everyone still benefits from it and it's well, lovely history to yeah, have that. it's a legacy mm -hmm. that will always be there, right? Um, did they keep some part of the golf course? I mean, is there? Did this no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It all went to it all went to town. But um, and then there's also sailing. As I said, was very big, and sailing started about 1890 at the club, and the first regatta was in '95, and. Um, then the club had the largest uh, freshwater six-meter fleet. They're beautiful boats. Um, Bob Miles used to photograph them. And um, in the books of Charlevoix, you can see pages after pages of them. They're just stunning. And then about the same time, just a little bit later, uh, the Chicago Club had the first fleet of NM1s, you know, sure. northern Michigan. One designs, and they were made by a, a man from Milwaukee. And once again, they're about seven, I think. And they had races all the time, and it was, and it was quite competitive, and again, beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Are some of those boats still around? No, I think they're all gone, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they're so stunning. And then when I was growing up, we had um, the Hawks, the fiberglass, the Blue Hawks, and Belvedere had a fleet too, and we'd race. Hence the anxiety of going out the channel, tacking out, trying to and you always beat them, right? miss the trestle. As I said, I was just crew. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get to skip her. So, um, yeah, no, as I said, it was just a great way to grow up and be exposed to all these things. Now, being up kind of more in the nature, I guess you would call it, I mean, is that, did that have an influence on you too, just being? Out, able to be outside and to do all these kind of things. Oh, exactly, and, and of course there's the island, mm -hmm. which um, you know every generation had their had its aficionados of the island, and usually they're making forts and getting poison ivy <laughs> covered in calamine lotion, um, and that's still happening, you know, today. But I think the deer use the island more than anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. How big is the island? I believe it's about 10 acres. It might have, it's sort of eroding, as you know, from uh, all the boat traffic and such. You know, we weren't shored up as Belvedere was in, I think, the 70s, maybe? Mm -hmm. Late 70s? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they, you know, put in the revetment. There was a wooden revetment years and years ago, but I think one of the passenger boats or something um, just had a little mishap. <laughs> And um, it was never repaired and, you know, kind of disintegrated. But it's, you know, it's lovely because it's that last natural 
shoreline, you right. know? Yeah. And um, so we're very lucky to have that. So is there anything on the island? The deer. That's it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Nobody has something built in the back. No, it's, it's, it's a park. You know, you're, I don't right. think you're allowed to Good. have structures there, except, you know, maybe a little fort that might last so a couple of weeks. So did you spend some time out there when you were young? Yes, but I always got a lot of poison ivy, so I kind of... Ah, stayed away. Let the, you know, the other kids do that. Mm -hmm. it. Um, if somebody wanted to know, you know, the Chicago Club, do you think, will continue for a long time? Oh, I hope so. As I said, this tradition and people coming back and bringing their children when they start having families, um, because there's such a great sense of tradition and freedom, but also it's safe, and just are always so beautiful. Yeah. Sorry, not to say the town's name, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, but it is. Okay. So and there's, there's just something about having the water and the green. Mm -hmm. It's just so spectacular weather is, in the summertime. Are there new people coming into this or is it always the same families? No, which is great because there are um, new families that have become members because you have a cottage and you have so many children not everyone can you know right. keep it because they all have different interests or they move further away sure. or just different situations and so sometimes families you know, cannot keep their cottage and therefore it becomes open and it's lovely getting new people, you know. Is it something that we need as, as a country to, to have this kind of a summer place for all of us, you know? Well, I think sure always everyone's summer place, it really you is. know, it's, um, and has been for years when they had all the, um, well the train definitely brought up many, many people, but when they had all the hotels here and then all the boat traffic coming up from Chicago and Milwaukee. So what do you remember as, you know, being very young? I, I don't know, were the trains still coming then? Well, just, just the freight train okay. at that point, the C and O, or the, yeah, Chesapeake and Ohio. And when we were small, we were down at the beach. It went very slowly because they were waiting, it would just chug, chug, chug past the depot. And um, our beach is right there next to the trestle. And um, it would have to wait for the trestle man to swing the bridge. And it was just a tiny freight train, you know, three cars maybe, but we always would ask the caboose man to blow his whistle. Yeah. And we'd climb the ladder and, and ask, please, please, please. <laughs> and he would, and that, was, that would make our day. Yeah. And, um, and I said also, you know, being able to go on field trips to Mackinac Island or Beaver Island and um, sometimes have a camp out. You know, so it was kids. more than a summer camp because the whole family was there. I, exactly. It was like going to camp except your parents were there. So Is that okay? <laughs> and that was you know, a good thing and a bad thing, but I loved it. As I said, you, um, and you all got together again at dinner time. And so did you know your grandparents? Were they? They were there too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So very lucky. I think that's important to have this multi-generational experience mm -hmm. because so many times our communities are spread out and you don't get that contact as much. So did you, your grandfather tell you stories at all? Well, my grandmother did, but it was my great-grandfather who uh -huh. um, came here. He was courting my great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shaw was very important to him. And uh, he wrote a, a book about it. Okay. And he was involved with town and, uh, and with the library here, the other library, the smaller one. But. Um, so I said I heard stories about what it was like when he first came and, you know, from my grandmother and my mother. So it's about the same, but then it also changes too, you know, with each generation. What were the traditions that you remember about going into town with the, your grandmother? Oh, it was a very big deal. And you had to um, come in either with, you know, older children or the counselors. And everyone had a love affair with Murdoch's, you know, and you had that picket fence and you practically fell over it as they were making the fudge. Um, and then we got to come in when they had the band performances on Wednesday nights, I believe. And you got to sit on the lawn and they had that fish pond. and um, That was a treat. But what was quite exciting was Dairy Queen. And if one did rather well at tennis, you know, if you hit the Wilson tennis can ball, you know, tennis can over, or if you 
put so many balls in your racket or did something, you got to go to Dairy Queen. So now the Dairy Grill, but yes. that was key. What were your favorite thing at Dairy Grill? Oh, all the above, oh, <laughs> you know, the entire oh, menu. Okay. <laughs> but everyone, it was Venetian that I think was a highlight of the summer. And uh, the Chicago Club, not maybe every year, but every other year, did a float. As okay. There were a lot more floats back then. And there was the parade that I think started later. Um, but terribly overexciting, you know, to stay up that late and there's a picnic and then you would go down to the boathouse and or around by the boathouse and you know either pull out your you know sailboat or right. boat and just sit there and just wait and wait and wait you saw the parade go by and then the fireworks it was as I said a highlight of the summer mm -hmm. did you get to know and still the, is <laughs> yeah did you get to know any of the kids that lived here at that time or was there really a separation I think because we had so many lessons, you know, we got up and then we had, you know, swimming in the morning and sailing was always in the afternoon. After that, <laughs> Trestle <Right. laughs> moved across. Um, I said, but there are so many of us that we kind of stayed more on grounds mm -hmm. in our in our little age groups. So you really didn't get to know any of the kids in town. You were just going and do these events. No, uh, and um, or to go to this beach here. Or Going to Michigan Beach was also yeah. a big treat, or to Fisherman's Island, or to Sugar Beet on right. picnics and that type of thing, because the Michigan Beach had the best swings. Yeah. You know, so. Still does. I know. <laughs> and a much bigger beach, so. Yeah. Did you go out in the Big Lake? Did you ever sail on the Big Lake? Never sail, but it was, as I said, very special, because usually we would go in, because it was calmer right. in Lake Shawboy. Mm -hmm. But when they took that turn into Round Lake, then you knew you're going to Lake Michigan. So I said Fisherman's Island was fun. And also I used to have my birthday parties when I was very small on Michigan Beach.